Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Today, I am honored to have William Thompson on the show. William was born and raised in Glasgow and has been aware of the spirit world since he was 10 years old. He's going to talk about that in the very beginning, how he was introduced to spiritualism and how he just jumped into um, spirituality um, as as a young person. And as you know, that's what this podcast is all about. So I'm so excited about it. Um, As a minister of the Spiritualist National Union, which is the highest appointment with the SNU, he has achieved a great variety of awards of the Spiritualist National Union, holding diplomas in teaching, public speaking, as well as certificates of recognition, teaching, healing, public speaking, and demonstration. He is a course organizer and approved tutor of the author, author, Arthur Finley College near London. And the Arthur Finley College is the, I guess, arguably, but the most renowned college in the world for mediumship. And and I've tried to go a few times because what is going on in the world, I haven't been able to make it. Bill's passion is in the teachings of spirit and helping others to experience this joy by carrying out services, seminars, private readings, and private healing. His reward is working with others and seeing the joy in their faces as they develop an understanding of the mechanics of their mediumship and feeling the spirit world close to them. Welcome to the program, Bill. Thank you very much. And is it okay to call you Bill? Yes, please. That's normal, yes. Yes, William is my Sunday name or when I'm home with my family. Right, right. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, Bill, I know that um, this all started with you when you were um, going down this spiritual path, which all children, children, you know, have have with them, but some do, some follow it and some do not. So, tell us a little bit about the beginning. Yes, the the beginning for myself, I could really see now where everything was almost laid out in front of me to follow. Uh, Spiritualism and uh, the spirit world was not part of my normal family structure. It came through meeting my best friend at school, Ian Cherry, and Ian's mum was a medium. And I used to stay with him at the weekends. And it was there that I was introduced to mediumship and the spirit world. As children, we would sit and listen to the adults speak about things like the spirit world. And when they went into the bedroom and they had their circle, we would hear all these rappings or knocks on the the, the ceiling or the wall. But we thought nothing of it because it was normal. And Marie, who is Ian's mum, she saw there was something, some ability that I had there. And she made us play games. And I realize now the games was psychometry, where she used to give us an object and say, tell me a story. And she says, it doesn't matter what it is, just tell me a story. And because there was no expectation or pressure upon you, and it was simply like telling a story, it really allowed the natural development of one's own sensitivity. And what was beautiful, no matter what you said, it wasn't right nor wrong, but always there was an encouragement. 
what else can you say? What do you feel? Do you feel good with it? Are you finished now with the story? So each step, there was this support and encouragement. And I never realised, because it was natural, that it wasn't what was deemed normal. Right. So I, I'm sorry. Um, and you were 10 years old, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so 10 years old, you've been to school and, you know, being in a home that wasn't um, really religious or spiritual, but you still felt such normal normalcy in it. Yes. For, for myself, it was so normal uh, because just to be in the atmosphere or the energy of it, it felt like home. And that's why I had such a joy to almost stay every weekend with Ian, because there was a feeling of being home, really. And it's the best description I could give of it. Uh, the, 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 the challenge was when I came home and, and uh, my father would ask about it. For him, it wasn't, this was the, the, the work of the devil sort of thing, because he comes from a, or he came from a Roman Catholic background. And my mum was so excited. What? So, <laughs> yeah, two, two contrasts, because my father was a Roman Catholic, my mum was a Protestant. Uh, but from my mum's side, she had an Aunt Amelia who had the ability to look in the fire, and we call it to read the fire. And she could tell the neighbours when during the war, someone was going to get a brown letter. A brown letter is what the, the government would say when your, your husband or your son had died. So she really had this ability. So for my mum, there was a kind of knowledge there. But for my father, it was a work of the devil. Interesting. Really, and uh, yeah. So Bill, what do you, um, in today's world, what, what can parents, what do you suggest that parents or caregivers, you know, that they can, to encourage them, or what would you say about doing these kinds of games with kids today? I, I think uh, it's not just about doing games of sensitivity with the spirit world. I think I, as a norm, everything that a child does it should be in some form of supportive or, or encouraging way. And then we allow the naturalness of it to come out. How often have we heard people say, my imaginary friend is with me? Yes. And it's so common. And what for me is very, very sad when the parents say, stop it, it's your imagination, stop doing this. And then it brings this natural fear of wanting to express what I see, what I feel, what I feel, rather than saying, that's nice. And you don't have to get into a long conversation with them, but at the same time, you don't stop the, the, the naturalness of it. And then you'll find that those children who really have the, the natural ability to have some form of connection or communication with the spirit world, they then almost speak as the third person. Mum, can me and my friend have lunch together today? And if you can imagine how it would feel for the mother to say, yes, would you like me to get him a, a dinner plate to sit with you? You know, so you're bringing the naturalness with it. And there's nothing then deemed as you're strange, you're different. So therefore, you're not inhibiting the child. And that, I believe, should be a part of every parent, parent's uh, duty, is this encouragement of the child, not necessarily with the spirit world, but in life in general. Because yes. we need children of today to truly, truly be this creative soul because that's the world, what the world needs. We need children who can see and live and create the dreams of life. And our spirituality 
is part of it. It's not all of it. Do you feel that by doing this and you yourself personally, that it helped you develop, I'll call it an inner strength to know that there's something bigger, you know, like when things would get tough or, yeah, can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, has it made me stronger uh, without a shadow of a doubt? Yeah, and growing up. And, and everything, and even today, it continues. So if I think of my journey as a child uh, from 10 to 16, uh, it was a very challenging time. Yes. Uh, I come from a, a very big family. So I have four brothers and four sisters. Wow. So you imagine it's a big family. Uh, my, my father was a... Uh, a difficult man, he had uh, alcohol problems. So, and my mum was the main supporter of the family. And she also worked. So you, you can imagine how difficult it was, even just financially. Yeah. You know, so here, uh, you started to appreciate the little things in life as true gifts. So, so here, it brought my attention from that part and as I have grown older to recognize and embrace the small gifts of life and the spirit world for me are my greatest gift you know and I've been asked before how can you describe the greatest gift in your life and for myself the closest point I can come to is when I think when I was there at the birth of both my children that, that you cannot describe that. Yes. It really is something that has such an impact upon you. And that's the same for me with the spirit world. It has the same level and impact. It gave me the strength and the courage to, to leave Glasgow when I was 16 to join the military. How did I know to leave? Because the feeling was so strong within me. And I, I, I start, I left school and I started to work in a butcher shop. And I was only there about four weeks. And I thought, this is not right. And I just, when I got the bus and into the town centre, I have no idea why. And I went to the army recruiting centre. And just, and just got all the paperwork Then had to bring the paperwork home because you had to be 17 to join the military on your own, or you had to have your parents' consent. So I, so I went and I said to my parents, my mum didn't want me to go because I, I, I was my mum's favourite. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I caught, I'm very proud even today to say I'm a mummy's boy. <laughs> and I realised well, I had no problem with that. My father was happy that I was going. And he was happy not because I was leaving, because then I could send a sum of money home every month. So he seen it then as an investment for right. help and family. Uh, and also because I was different from everyone else in the family, it made his life a little bit easier. So, uh, and uh, yes, and the spirit world terrified him, really did. I remember there was an occasion when Marie, that's Ian's mum, came to visit my mum. Uh, and my father and my mum were sitting together in the living room. And my dad could see her coming across the road and he, he said, here comes that witch. He really, oh so, so he sat there when Marie came in and she was there for about maybe two hours. And he sat there the whole time with his newspaper in front of his face. And never once did he change the, the page. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so I couldn't understand it at the time. It really only took me to years later to understand the depth of his fear through his rel religious upbringing. Mm -hmm. It was so big. And I remember you talking about, I'm jumping ahead here a little yeah. bit, but um, that that all changed after he had a near-death experience. Absolutely, it was, and 
it truly, truly transformed him. Uh, my mum had died and totally unexpected. Uh, she was at 50, discovered she had cancer. Then three months later, she was gone. And can you tell us about that? Because I know you went to a medium that told uh, you. Yeah, about it. Brody, I think it is. Yeah, I, I'll finish with my dad. Part Great. Back Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. Uh, with my uh, father. And he was in the hospital. We got a telephone call to come to to see see him because he wasn't going to live. And as we got there in the hospital, he was there sitting up, happy and smiling. And we expected to go to see him as he passed away. And I asked him what, what happened. He says, I felt myself go up these stairs. And at the top of the stairs, there was this door. And in front of the door, your mother was there. And she says to me, William, it's not your time. Go back. And here I am. And what touched me, he then said, now I understand everything that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. And for me, myself, that, that that was a gift. It truly, truly was. So even today, when I think about it, and the gift was not only for myself, but it was also for my father, because he knew when his time was coming, he wasn't going to hell and damnation or anything. But he realized that when his time comes, my mum is going to be there for him. Mm -hmm. And it took all his fear away. And for myself, if every single person realized that there is something beyond this physical life, call it the spirit world or whatever, then we, we recognize we have nothing to fear of death for death is simply a natural process of life. So that really was the gift for both of us, I would say. When you asked about my mum, the lady's name was, was Bridie. Uh, Bridie was not a, a conventional medium. She, she was a, a very special lady and you could never book an appointment with her. You always got an invitation. So, and the invitation would come from nowhere. So uh, my mum and that went to uh, see her. And normally you go twice. First, you go the, the first time and she gives you almost like a reading. And then the second time you go back, she breaks an egg and she would read the egg yolk. Uh, so, uh, a couple of people from my family went and the things that they were, they were given were incredible. Uh, I was in the military at the time and I was in Germany and they were told I would be leaving Germany and I would come to be in Edinburgh with the military. Never, never, never could you foresee that because Edinburgh is a very, very small detachment. So there's only about six people there. And to get, to get there is almost an impossibility. Uh, and my mum was given all this different stuff. And also she was told on the 1st of September, someone is going to die. And you think that's a big statement to make. Yes. And everything was all written down. And uh, so when everybody came back and they were speaking about it, I wasn't here. This is what I was told. And they all came to the conclusion, it's my dad. If anyone's going to die in the 1st of September, it's my dad, because he's always ill. And it turned out it was my mum. And at that time of the reading, no one knew that she was ill. So really, wow. and, and what is beautiful, we still have the notes of the sitting, taking that as must be now 30 years ago. And it was September 1st. First, exactly on the date. Wow. So, I mean, things like that are, are truly, truly incredible. Yeah. Uh, and when you, and you don't realize at the time, it's only afterwards when you have a time to digest it. Yes, yes. Then you find the enormity of it. 
and that's why uh, these times when I've been reflecting back to the beginning, and I realized, realized how fortunate I was, and really everything was laid out for me. Uh, my friend's mum, they moved to London when I was in the military, and I started in the parachute regiment, and we were a red berry. And one day I had a free weekend and I went to see Marie, that's Ian's mum. And as soon as I walked into the door, she stopped me and says, you have to take that red hat off your head. And I knew right away she was talking about the berry. And I, and I thought, but I love where I am. <laughs> right. But I trusted her 100%. And because of that, when I went back on the Monday to my, my battalion, I put in a request to change. And in that time of changing and in the next two years, there were a number of occasions where, where the, the, the people I were with were in a position of life-threatening experiences. Now, I'm not saying if I was there, something could have happened to me. But the potential was if I was there, something could have. <laughs> so I know here, this change, and it really changed everything. It was really, it was, yes, all different experiences like that are so clear and so powerful. Uh, I, I can't argue with it. It's beautiful. Right. So what, what you're saying is that when you asked to change, then you you did change and you were put into these where the, it was life threatening. It could have well, I, 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 if I had stayed where I was. Oh, if you would have stayed. I did. see. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I moved and it was and I was not in then in those situations. Right. When you were in the military, I I think I remember in an interview, didn't you go to a spiritualist church or you began some ministering? No, no. And uh, when I was in the military, I used to, when I came home and leave, we would go to uh, the, the churches, the Glasgow Association, uh, uh, a spiritualist church, uh, of which I, I'm a member and eventually I became the president of it. And it's the oldest spiritualist church in uh, one of the oldest in the UK because it's one of the founder members of the Spiritualist National Union. So wow. it really has an incredible history. And when I would go home and our family and I would go, some of us all go to the church. And I remember this one time, the medium, I even remember his name all these years, was a medium called Peter Close. And my father came through and he went to my young brother beside me. And he says, I have your father here with you, uh, with him. And he says, I have to call you Zippy. And we all went, we were shocked by it. And everybody's looking, what does it mean? But no one realized my young brother had had an operation and he had to cut all of his stomach up. And he's got these scars, it's like a zip on his body. Oh and, that's why they, and that's why when he said zippy, I mean, you cannot get a greater proof than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And here, wow. and, and with the Glasgow Association, I met some of the greatest mediums of the time, really. Mm -hmm. And the, the people of the church, they were so dedicated, it was incredible. I mean, they used to call the, uh, the Glasgow Association the Big Church of Scotland. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, because even then, when the ladies would come to church, they had these long gloves on and the hats. So it really it was their 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 religion, their, their place of worship. Yeah. And and I was so fortunate to be taken under the wings of a lady called Betty Whitelaw. And, and I did so much of further development there, and oh, it was incredible. Right. Well, I definitely want to talk about that, and, but before we do, so after the military, I know yeah. you did make it to Edinburgh, so yeah. can you talk about that? 
Yes, so when I was in Edinburgh, um, I initially I was there for six months because that, that was initial, we call it a posting to be placed there. But that was like the place everybody wanted to be posted. Is that yes, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. and that's why you thought it would never happen. It would never, never happen. It's like yeah. the jewel of the crown. Uh, and uh, I ended up staying there for two years. Mm -hmm. But in that two years, the intensity of working with the spirit world was so big that I decided to leave the military. I, I couldn't stop because when the, 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 that presence is so clear with me, I, I just then I have to go. And if I think I had completed 14 years service by then, in the military, I'd done 14 years. Right. And I was wanting to do 22 years because after 22 years, then you get a pension. So I thought, and I could do this. So I decided I have to give it all up. And Edinburgh then was my last official military place. And then I went back in, to Glasgow uh, and started to, to work there. But then really, the moment I left the, uh, the military, my spiritual work just exploded incredible just everything just fell into place wow then i started with uh, going into glasgow association got on to the committee joining the district council then coming the vice president the president so i got all you could say the the administrative side of it as well as well as my uh, mediumship side and the, the sorry no, go ahead. And, and in Glasgow, as I said, they really were what we call the old school. I remember when I was doing a, a service, <clears throat> one of the ladies I called Anne Hodgkinson, and she was a, a very, very good medium. She was a very small lady. And everyone was terrified of her. <laughs> really, she and she really was a powerhouse. And I was coming to do the service and she was my chairperson. And I thought, oh, no, no, no. Please, God, help me. <laughs> because I know afterwards you get this critique. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> so I, I did the service and I thought to myself, that was really, really good. And I was so happy with it. And I was walking away. Then all I heard was, Bill, Bill, come here, please. And I thought, oh, no. I thought I'd escape. <laughs> she says, that was a very nice service. And I went, Oh, wow, and thank you very much, And Then it was, however, she <laughs> says, you were talking to people, not to sheep. And I thought, what do you mean, Anne? She says, on two occasions, you use the word use. It is you. Use is a name for sheep. <laughs> I mean, that's what she says. I have to tell you, when I started, I went for elocution lessons so that she could really pronounce everything correctly. Right. And at the time, I thought, that's terrible to tell someone that. But then I realized what was behind it. For her, it was the importance that the message from the spirit world comes with a clarity. Right. And I've never forgot that lesson. You know, wow. that was the that was the quality of the people. It truly really was the life. So, Bill, when you say that um, your the spiritual world for you just exploded, what what exactly? How was spirit? How does spirit come to you, and how does that work for you? For for me. Uh, if I wanted to describe myself, I would say I'm a close sentient medium. I go with feelings, but my feelings can create images and can create a sound. So, but I'm not really here in the spirit world and I'm not really seeing the spirit world, but my senses, that, that, that or your imagination, which is a creative tool, that's what builds it. And that's when sometimes I see, sometimes I hear. But most of the time I feel. But what interests me is I can feel the color of someone's eyes. 
you know, and, and I, wow. that, used, that used to confuse me until I watched a documentary of how a blind person through vibration can tell the difference of color. Interesting. So, so when you bring that principle in, your imagination then is a creative tool that really can uh, understand that vibration of that color. Wow, that's fascinating. It's, it really, uh, for that, so my, my clear sentence really is my, my, my strength. Yeah. I can feel, for instance, when someone goes to the spirit world, I can feel the, the condition they wear before they pass over. So if they have a health condition that's affect the physical body, I can feel that within my body. Mm -hmm. If they have a, if someone, for instance, has dementia, when I'm working, I have absolutely no idea where I'm going. Normally, if I'm working and if it's within a church, I can go to a person, I have your father, et cetera. But when I don't have that experience, I then know I have someone here who has either some form of dementia. And as soon as I've said that, then my mind clears and I understand who it is. So that, 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 that experience is then used as a shortcut for me that tells me about a condition of someone. Right. But again, it's through feelings. Mm. And it's, uh, so um, oh, I had a question. What was it? Oh, important question. What have you learned or been told that it, it's like on the other side? I've, I've thought about this many, many times. <laughs> and if someone asks me, I have to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. But I remember on one occasion on, in a, a trans demonstration, the spirit world explained it like this. If you have someone who lives in the North Pole and you try to describe a jungle to them, they wouldn't understand. But they're both in the same world. Mm -hmm. So then that logically helps us to understand that within the spirit world, that it's almost like worlds within worlds within worlds, or realms within realms within realms. And my own understanding is that each of us are drawn to people who are like minded as ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then with that, then you can understand what we would term as heaven and hell is a position that we create depending on how we live our life. Right. Yeah. If you think uh, my ex-father-in-law was a very, very strong Roman Catholic, went to chapel every day. And when he passed to the spirit world, he came through one time only. And he says, I don't care that there is a life beyond this. I still believe in my Jesus and I still go that path. So even though he'd went to the spirit world, his life's history went with him. Right. So then, then we can understand when we say there is an eternal progress open to every human soul, one of our principles. So we can understand through, I use the descriptive word time, through time, then each of us then can evolve until we come to the one part that you may call the universal mind, God, or whatever. It doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah. And that's what the eternal journey is. And that's why when we go to the spirit world, I truly, truly believe we're exactly how we were whilst we're here on earth. It's simply just the physical body has been laid aside. That, that, that part which we describe as our soul, our higher self, that consciousness that goes and evolves beyond physical death, that, that's what we touch. And then that consciousness is every experience we've had within our life. Mm. And it's, it's a beautiful concept for me. Yes, so, absolutely. I think of um, all the near-death experiences that I've I've listened to and and spiritual transformative and it's very much what comes back is very much 
which is what you were saying. Yeah. And if you think of those with near-death experience, mm -hmm. they always have this desire to go home. Yes. When people start to develop their sensitivity and their mediumship, and they have their first experience, it's a very, very powerful experience. Because suddenly their soul recognizes, here is home. And that's why for those who are walking the spiritual pathway, it really becomes a part of life in which we need to walk because we know we're walking towards our home. Yeah. yeah. And, what is, and what is beautiful is in every religion, every belief system. And we're all part of the one whole. We just have different thought processes. Right. And for me, that, that's what our, our true spirituality should and must be. You know, we don't have to agree with each other. But let's just help one another get along our path where we walk. Exactly. It really, it really changes how one walks in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and for me, some of the most spiritual people are people who have no spiritual connection consciously. They're just really beautiful human beings. Yes, yes. Isn't that so true? And, and I think that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, why do you do such a deed? Simply because I want to. And for myself, that's their spirit within them really communicating. But they don't have to associate it with any belief system. Right, right. Or it's, sometimes they do. I mean, yeah. sometimes they're yeah. even like that and and they're involved in a religion but there's yeah. still that yeah that soulfulness mm -hmm. yeah um you know you talk about <clears throat> you say our stories are the gems of life and how you wouldn't change anything in your life and you did have some hard times and can you just elaborate on that a little bit I remember many years thinking back, I wish my childhood was easier and better. I wish there was a better relationship uh, with my father. But I realized those experiences allowed me to understand how it would be for other people. You know, because you, you say you've walked the walk, so you can understand that. So when, you, when you're working with people, then you can understand their pain. You know, if you think, and I mean this with the greatest of respect to all the young mediums of today, if they don't have their life experience, then that there's a different perception right. of what it means. And when I think both, with, especially within my military experience, I saw some of the most challenging times in my life uh, where a mother driving a tank uh, ran over the top of her own child oh. and the grandmother was holding the child's hand and it, the, the little girl was only six years of age oh uh, and so you, you can imagine that experience oh. and because it was a big a big family day we were less than two meters away from it. And we had to sit there for two hours with the body of the child under the tank until we could get specialists. And you, you can imagine how that mother must have felt, how the grandmother must have felt. I know for, for myself, and today I realize by what really should have happened that all of us who were there should have had some form of support and there was no support you're a soldier you go on with it and my, my saving grace for that was my mum because I could write all my pain is the right word yeah the pain it was there because even when I think of it just now suddenly I'm back to the emotion of yeah. it it has left a huge huge impact on me even now and I really then had a struggle with God. And so the only time in my life I really, I, I could say I fell out with God. 
because I couldn't understand how a God of unconditional love could let this happen. And then only afterwards I realized it's human life. It was an accident. It had nothing to do with God. But at that time with the pain in it, that was my way of almost a release. I can put the blame somewhere. Yes. And because God is so important to me, that's where I put the blame. And my healer, you could say, is, was my mum, because I just used to write her letters and letters and letters, and she understood everything. So that, that was my support system. Through that, it allowed me then to understand how it feels to lose a child, how the pain of a mum, et cetera, is. You know, and you really can associate with that so strongly because it has, it really leaves an imprint upon you. So here, I was able to use that, and still today, when I can feel that, I know exactly what it is. So when I can understand it, uh, but at the same time, uh, my brother-in-law died. Uh, he also had an alcohol problem. And he was a huge big Irish man. He was like a huge bear, massive. His hands were really <laughs> big. Alistair. And he had a terrible fear of the spirit world. And I rem remember they used to play snooker at my home. And he'd come up and he says to me one day, he says, okay, then prove it. Really show me the spirit world's a real thing. And I says, okay. Uh, and, and I got this gentleman that I, I didn't know. And I started to describe him. And I uh, so spoke about how he lost one hand in a farming accident. Then Alistair just shouted and swore and ran out the house. And it's only, we were speaking afterwards, because it really freaked him out. He says, that was my uncle. Oh my not, gosh. Not, not even my sister, his wife knew about it. And uh, when he came very ill and uh, he was in the hospital and, and he knew he was dying and he asked me to stay with him and his family because he wanted to feel secure that he was going somewhere after that, after he passed away. And that was a gift for me. Yes. But to be there, to have that experience, to, 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 to be with someone that is a move from one world to the next is a, a, a gift to be given, mm. no matter how difficult it is. My father's passing was horrendous. He bled from every orifice of the body for days. And uh, I kept thinking, you would never do this with an animal. So you can see the pain there. Yeah. But with my grandmother, it was the most beautiful, incredible experience ever. The whole room, everyone could feel it. And she's supposed to have died two weeks ago, but she told the doctor she's not going to die because she's waiting for her son to come back from holiday. Oh. Nobody, nobody, nobody's allowed to tell her, tell him. And my uncle George came in and she, you could see she was really struggling. She looked at him and suddenly she lit up and the whole room, uh, if I say it, it came magnetized. And she looked at him, she says, did you have a good holiday, son? And he says, it was beautiful, mum. She went, good, then closed her eyes and went away. Oh my goodness. The, the, the theme we're talking about, I feel all the hairs. Yeah. The, the I mean, I was the only spiritualist, but everyone could feel it. Yeah. And if I tried to put a label upon it, it was true, unconditional love. Yeah. And nobody was oh, sad. wow. So, and I've had so many different experiences, very, very challenging, and like my grand was beautiful. You know, and what I saw... Uh, uh, when I was watching the older mediums, it was incredible. I need to tell you about one. Uh, uh, she was a medium called May Tate. Uh, and I mean this with the greatest of respect. When May looked healthy, she looked dead. She really had this. 
really uh, that, that was just just <clears throat> her <after>. look <laughs> yeah totally and uh, and normally on a sunday we have two services in the church the first one is 11 30 and the, that second one's at 6 30 in the evening so may came and did the morning service and that was really nice and she came in in the evening service and i'm looking at her i thought you look worse than you normally do and she looks like that and i'm even looking i mean no color and i says to her are you okay me she says i'm fine yes i'm fine i says but this morning you look better she says i know i've just signed myself out of hospital ah. what do you mean she says yes she went home she fell asleep and she put the gas oven on without real lighting it so the, the neighbor who's lucky came to see her and they got an ambulance for her. Oh my God. And, and she signed herself out of the hospital because she made the commitment to do the church service. That, that's what I mean about the, 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 the quality of the medium then. These people, it was their life, their church was a life. And that was a caliber. Who would do that today? Wow. Just to have that sort of <clears throat> spiritualist community, it's Thank just, you. it's changed so much. Do you think that, do you think we'll ever get back there again to have the way you grew up? And No, oh, I, I don't see it. Yeah. I, I don't see it simply because you could say mankind has taken another step in its evolution. You know, if you think, if at that time the, 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 their, their spirituality was also the way of life. I mean, most, yes. e most evenings they would sit together in circles in their own home or come to church for a circle. Right. They would do that. And that's why the development of, of their mediumship was so much different from today. I mean, these people sat for their whole life. You know, and they dedicated their time to the spirit world, to their spiritual beliefs. Today, we, we don't have that with people who come for a weekend seminar and they want to then go and change the universe. Right. And, you know, and what, what happened, and a lot, speaking with a lot of my colleagues at, uh, at Stansted, we, 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 we lost the spirituality and we move to the mechanics of our mediumship. Yeah, yeah. And we really need to so change, true. to come back to the spirituality. And then the mediumship, the mechanics of the mediumship is a side part of it. The true parts of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And that's what these people had. And to interweave that with the importance of bringing that into the world for are young people who are so, so many are so lost today. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. For myself, we have a responsibility for the people of today. Yes. We are creating their future. And if you think what we spoke at the beginning about the encouragement of children, if you think we've used things like IT as a surrogate parent, you know, go in front of you, your, uh, your computer, you know, if you're very good, go on your laptop. If you're very bad, I'll take your laptop off you. Exactly. You know, so, so we've lost this ability to truly communicate. And when I think, when I, I've seen this a number of times, and at first I saw it and I smiled, where you see children walking down the road, and they would be messaging each other, but they're standing next to each other. Right. You know, you think, so where's this communication? And if you think of things like Christmas, it was a family event. You know, you played games together. You created things together. Now what happens is they get some form of laptop or new game or something. Let me disappear to New Year. Mm. You know? We need to bring back this art of conversation, you know, because if we don't, we then lose the creativity. Yeah. And, and the, the world needs dreamers. 
They really do. And the children are the dreamers of tomorrow. And we need to really encourage their creativity because they dream them and other people create the dreams into a reality. Yeah. And that's what evolves the world. But we need this connection and this encouragement of the children of today. You know, look at the world, how beautiful it is. You know, how good is it just to walk through a forest, sit by a lake? How good is it just to sit outside and chat to your friends? In a way, you could say it's almost like going back to the basics, the basic form of communication. Because if you think the greatest gift that we can give to one another really is to say, I see you. Yes. That's what we need to do to the children. I see you. Because then when they can perceive this, then I believe this communication really comes forward. Right. I, I love with my, my grandkids. I really, I, I'm spooky granddad. And I remember uh, <laughs> one time. Spooky granddad. I love it. One time we're at my uh, son's house, we're having a barbecue, and uh, my grandson came up and says, Granddad, will you show me some magic? I says, come back later, I'll show you. And we had a paddling pool with water in it. So I says to my daughter, I says, go and get hot water and put it in the pool without them seeing. So then I shouted them over, I says, stand in front of the pool, what I want you to do is to close your eyes and just feel from your stomach all this power and throw it at the water and make it warm. And he went, Mah. I went, Logan, strong. And he went, Mah. he says, wow, that was great. See if it worked. And he put his hand in the water and the transformation of his oh my. face was incredible. <laughs> really, you could see, and that was the magic at that moment of transformation and then he started to chase his dad around the garden going wow, wow. <laughs> and that, that's what I mean about yes. with them really it's not getting down to their size but bring them up to our size mm -hmm. and really on an equal form right I mean I, I even with my kids and we were only talking about it uh, when I was over in Scotland uh, the other month, the memories they had were uh, in the winter, I would get them out of bed at two o'clock in the morning because it's been snowing. And we'd take the dog and we'd go quietly so we didn't wake the mum up. Right. And we'd go and we'd play snow angels and everything in the snow. Uh, oh. you know? Or in the evening, we'd be up the stairs and we'd get the duvet and the, 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 the pillows out. And we'd all lie on the floor, the three of us, looking at all the stars and telling yeah. stories. They do that with their kids. Wonderful. You know, and that really is, to me, about the communication. You know, you, you, you're going beyond the every day. You're touching the, 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 the real part inside of them. Yeah. And, and touching our own inner child. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, it's a level. Yeah, not, yeah. Not an adult and a child. It's really it's two souls that really connect to each other. Yeah. And you know, if you make that bigger and you think about it, if you think of, of children who have some form of mental disability where you cannot connect verbally with them, you know, their senses, they can feel how we connect with them from right. soul to soul. It's really, it's a non-verbal communication that has a power to make them realize they're seen. Absolutely. And any mother that has a child like that knows, totally. kn just knows in her heart and soul. Absolutely. And, and it's beautiful. <laughs> I had a nephew like that, James, uh, and he was the most beautiful, I mean, really like a Greek god. Uh -huh. it was so really beautiful. But mentally, his disability, he, he was like a, a one-year-old child. But he could just look at you and it's like speaking 
through your eyes to him. Yes. And he wouldn't do anything. You just had this connection. And there, there was his joy. So, so this, our children of today are so, so critical for the world of tomorrow. And if you think how, if our children today cannot communicate, and they are our leaders of tomorrow, how then can each country communicate with the other? Yes. And that really, I believe, is, is where our responsibility is, not, not just as parents and grandparents, but as a human being. You know, I think it's, it's crazy the society we're in where if a child falls, you're not encouraged to pick them up because it's not your child. I, I think that's madness. Oh, I agree. It goes totally against the human nature. I if you see a child being hurt, you cannot stop yourself. You know, and then we're putting all of these restrictions in. It's not politically correct. Come on, a child is in pain yeah yeah and if you cannot relieve the pain of a child then there's something wrong mm. something wrong with our whole universe it is i mean what is that done to us you know or an elderly person or anyone that needs some help yeah. that we so many <clears throat> not to judge it's just our society it seems just That's doesn't want to get involved or is mm -hmm. afraid to yeah and again it comes down to the same point communication yeah well we need to wrap it up this has been so wonderful and is there anything you'd like to like to say that i didn't ask or impart some words of wisdom <laughs> as always yeah uh Please, whoever you are in the world, be yourself. Don't be an illusion for anyone. Allow the presence of your own soul to be felt by everyone you're with. Be true to yourself, then you're true to everyone. And then the world becomes a better and beautiful place. So, and thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. And and Bill, if people want to find you, how would they, how would they do that? Uh, my website, I, I'm, I have to tell you, I am terrible at promotion <laughs> or advertising myself. I'm not um, very good either. <laughs> I, I am a disaster. So I ha even have to get a card pro uh, and it's just www.thompson-medium.com. Great. It's probably Great. the easiest way. But here I, yeah. I have my website and I don't And that it. in itself, you have that. That's a big step. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I had to get someone else to do it for me. <laughs> yeah. Of course, me too, me too. Yeah, so so I, I'm not this IT specialist. Yeah. I, I, this for me is face-to-face -face is to me a real communication. It's the best. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor. And I, I hope to meet you one day at Arthur <laughs> Finley. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. we'll take care and have a nice Thanks. evening. And you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at Interviews with Innocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you.